All right, so this is going to be an update not only for the YouTube channel, but also for my game dev project, the dev logs, the, uh, the game dev lecture series that I kind of started, and uh, a little bit of a surprise announcement towards the end. But everything's interconnected, so I felt like just one overarching video would make more sense than having separate pieces. But future me will toss up timestamps here in case you only care about, for example, the YouTube video or the YouTube channel. So, um, to start with, I have been dealing with some personal stuff, but uh, I am good now. I will, I will preface this section saying I'm good, I'm sleeping well, I'm eating healthy, I'm taking care of myself. I am good. Um, stuff is still not fully resolved, but everything takes time. Um, so what had happened, uh, before this last month is I was working so much that since there's so only so many hours in a day, I was just not sleeping so I could get more work done. Uh, and... I didn't realize that <laughs> it had gotten so bad until it was like the third week in a row where I had only slept like three days out of the week when I was like, oh, I'm about to burn myself out really bad. Uh, so I tapped on the brakes pretty good and addressed those issues. Um, yeah, part of, part of the problem is... <laughs> I, uh, I haven't, my, my therapy appointments, my, my seeing a therapist, psychologist, whatever, um, has come to an end. That's a whole other thing. Uh, but I'm managing fine on my own now. So it's, it's whatever. It's just, uh, an outside view probably would have caught it sooner. But, uh, the good news is I did not burn out. I, I did not have to slam on the brakes so hard that I stopped being productive. And uh, I haven't been having any 0% days or anything like that. Um, and yeah, the, the big the big takeaway is that like I was not sleeping properly. I was not eating properly. And when you're not taking care of your body and giving yourself enough you know time to rest and recover, you start perpetually becoming more and more tired uh you start struggling physically mentally and emotionally and as life does you run into barriers that become harder and harder to overcome but as i said i am good now um so that kind of rolls into the game development stuff so Part of the reason, a large part of the reason why I wasn't sleeping properly and uh, why I was working myself to the bone is because of the world map. So I had set the deadline for the summer to finish the world map. And obviously that deadline rolled past and I kept saying, okay, I'll, I'll get it done by next month. I'll get it done by next month. So I kept doubling down, working harder and harder and harder and it wasn't until I tapped on the brakes, took a step back and thought about it before I realized there were two big factors to that. So the first factor was up until this point, again, I'm seven years in at this point on this game development project. This is the first time I've ever gotten close to burnout, much less that close. And the reason why in simplest terms is I started releasing devlogs. I started publicly talking about the project I was working on. So I was putting more pressure on myself to meet deadlines, to be able to show my work, to be able to progress and, you know, show the check marks being ticked off. And uh, when I was failing to meet the deadline, instead of going, okay, why is the deadline not being met? What what estimation issue is there that made me think I would be done and I'm not done? And uh, yeah, that goes to the second point. 
So when I first made the prototype for the game, I made a 1080p world map, fleshed out, looked good, etc. Um, and the reason I made a 1080p world map is because I knew that would be an insufficient resolution for a 1080p screen. Because if you have a 1080p image across an entire 1080p screen, it looks good. But then if you zoom in on any particular region of that map, it's going to become pixelated. And I wanted to see how pixelated it became. And so based on that data um, and based on, you know, the, the desire to run the game on a 4K monitor, I realized I would need to have a much larger map. So I began work on the world map that I'm currently working on, the, the final world map for the game. And I decided I would make it 20 times the width and 20 times the height. But my monkey brain thought that that would be 20 times the work. So my estimate of I'll have it done by the summer was based on the idea that making a 20 times wider and 20 times taller image would take 20 times the work. But that's not how that works. If you do 20 times the work, you have only done one row and one column of the original size. So what it actually works out to is 400 times the work. So I'll take this moment to address why I'm doing a hand-drawn slash hand-painted world map rather than something that a lot of indie devs do, which is a procedurally generated map. And the main reason why is because I felt like procedurally generated maps have less character and are less appealing and are more bland. And so I decided I would do the, the hand-drawn map in the style of a hand-drawn or painted map in world that is being rolled out across a table so the generals can stand around it and make decisions of where to move troops and where to attack and whatnot. So like that's why I went with the hand-drawn 2D map. And I just didn't take the time to realize why my estimation was so wildly off. Now, the good news is based on the updated estimate of 400 times the work, then the world map would have taken two years plus, but I am more than halfway done after less than one year. Uh, it'll be one year starting January, just based on the man hours that the 1080p map took and then again, multiplying that by 400. So I'm actually ahead of schedule, but I was driving myself super hard thinking I was behind schedule because again, the estimation was off. So now with that corrected, it allows me to trickle down and uh, lay out the tentative schedule with a better understanding of that. Um, and that's part of the reason what you, the video you're seeing in the background here that's uh, me familiarizing myself more with Blender because I traditionally, I, I learned 3D modeling and animation for my degree in Maya and 3ds Max, which have different user interfaces, different hotkeys, different shortcuts, different menus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So until I get myself super familiar with Blender the way I am with Maya and 3ds Max, uh, it's going to take me longer to do the 3D art for the game than once I get everything familiarized, uh, at which point I'll be able to knock things out much more efficiently. And that kind of brings me to the point of, like, I am much faster and much happier with the results when I'm working with 3D models, um, in part because that's just what I have more experience with. So... I'm kind of considering trying to do something with 3D for the user interface, buttons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, rather than just 2D images. Because 
I kind of want a bit of consistency across the game. That's kind of critical for a uh, user or user experience to be consistent is to have like a unified flow of visual information. But that's future me's problem. <laughs> I'm going to focus on getting the playable alpha up and running. I guess technically it'd be a pre alpha because it's not going to have even like animations for the character classes or anything, but I'm going to focus on getting something tangible, playable, and, you know, vis visually something I can show to get it done sooner than later. Um, so I will use placeholder user interface systems as I go. Um, but it does bring me to my ideal version of the game, which included 2D character art and setting pieces and art for the questing system and such and based on how long i take to do high enough resolution work and based on my proficiency I, i'll be the first to say my 2d art is not world class by any stretch of the imagination so while i'm happy with how the world map looks i think my goal is going to be to actually, at the point where I need to, find funding to hire a 2D artist for the character art and setting pieces and story art and quest art and whatnot. Um, again, that's Future Me's problem, but that's something I'm kicking around. And publishers, when you haven't published a game, when you haven't successfully finished and put out a game especially if you know it, so like if you have put out a game and it was wildly successful publishers are willing to work with you on you know equal footing if you've put out a game and it hasn't done great publishers are going to be more cautious and more restrictive and more controlling of the, uh, of the situation and <laughs> if you have not put out a game at all and you just have a working alpha or whatnot, publishers are gonna run you through the ringer. And I intend to reuse assets, code, etc., for future projects. And that means I can't afford to give a publisher ownership of any of the parts of my game, which basically will make negotiations completely more or less impossible with most publishers. Um, I'm still open to the idea of going to a publisher for funding at a future point when I have more bargaining chips on the table. But at present, I'm thinking definitely... I, I've been kicking around different uh, funding ideas for various things. Uh, specifically, the thing that initially started it was multiplayer, but that's a thing that I'll talk about in just a moment. But... Um, yeah, so the the publishers, it's an option. It's not a great option. It's not an option I really want to go with. But crowdfunding, while it has a bit of a dirty name in the game development circle, it is an option, and it's an option that would make me beholden to all the individuals who backed the project rather than some corporate interest that will run me through the ringer again. And so that is currently, I think, the plan. So I'm going to get the game at least to a beta build. I, I refuse to go to Kickstarter unless I have something fun. And while maybe not fe uh, you know feature complete and maybe not aesthetically complete, something that people can actively play and enjoy while I finish the rest of the game with the help of the funding that I earn. So I will not go to Kickstarter until I do have a solid, tangible thing that I can basically immediately give to the backers to play with. So, yeah, as I said, the idea of getting funding was initially for... A, a online solution, a online multiplayer solution. Ideally asynchronous so that you can actually play 
when convenient for everyone involved and you don't have to complete uh, you know everything in order like you can play separate matches against separate people at your leisure but uh, yeah Unity has this year released integrated multiplayer solutions including a Unity server solution I do need to do a lot more research I do need to do a lot more work and developing a lot more understanding of exactly how it all works and how everything goes together. And I don't understand exactly how the Unity server billing practices work. Uh, it does say something like you have to have a thousand monthly active users before they start charging you. But they also say, oh, there's this bandwidth restriction, this hard drive space restriction, blah, blah, blah. So obviously I want to make sure that I'm not going to like hemorrhage money doing it. But I can say with almost certainty, there will be online multiplayer. And I will just go ahead and toss this out at the end of this uh, game dev section. So tentatively, my new soft deadline for the world map being finished is February 2023. And uh, yeah, so... At the end of the video, I'm going to have a tentative schedule for everything all together. But um, I will definitely still be releasing updates when major points are reached. And I still do hope to have a playable alpha by January 2024. But that's a soft deadline. I'm not going to crunch again. I'm not going to try to almost burn myself out again. I am going to wait until... It is good to go, and at that point, I will make it available to those who basically are around to help uh, test it. And at the very least, I'll be able to demonstrate stuff. Um, but the bigger uh, goal is to actually have a Steam page up with something tangible sooner than later, uh, probably by again, January 2024, once I have systems I can demonstrate and videos I can put together along with, you know, concepts and blah, 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 blah. So that's it for the game dev stuff. Now, the YouTube channel, which I have jokingly in the past called The Long Con because of the goal of developing the YouTube channel specifically to promote my game dev work is not actually doing anything for it. Um, so the elevator pitch has 368 views as of recording this. And that's not a lot, especially since more than half of those views are subscribers, some of which who only watched it specifically because, again, I've been pushing that it subsidizes the rogue tech content. So that's not really going to be a thing anymore. Um, like I will still release little videos whenever I meet random checkpoints of the game development, but it's not going to be a monthly thing that I spend, you know, a couple days a month working on. I would rather just spend those days working on my game instead. Um, and that brings me to what do I do with the YouTube channel? So YouTube, the way it works, very much promotes just having daily consistent uploads. And it also kind of promotes just making one type of content. Um, Based on my experiments, there is chances for a video that is not part of your, you know, like primary content that people subscribe for to get a massive spike of viewership, but that's not reliable. And even when it does happen, it doesn't really result in growth. So instead, I'm going to do two, well, I guess technically three things. Um, I said two originally because one's Rogue Tech and one's the Dev Lecture series. But Rogue Tech is going to be both the Comprehensive Guide series as well as Challenge Run Mark III. 
Yeah, I know. I haven't released a video in like almost two weeks. I know. The reason why is the save break is supposed to be coming any day now. And as of recording, it's not out. But maybe even by the time this goes live, the save break might have come and, you know, been uh, arrived. And I realized, well, obviously this Challenge Run Mark III, I've said over and over, I'm waiting until after the save break. That way I can update and play for the for, you know, foreseeable future for, for however long until the next major save break, which this handheld rework has been in the works for a long time. And it's actually the save break that I've been most excited for. Um, so I'm very much excited to get into Challenge Run Mark III. I'm definitely going to release those videos likely Monday through Friday. Um, I am going to stop doing the MechLab Mondays in part just because... Uh, they're they're fun, but I feel like just playing the challenge run is more beneficial to just me. Um, I just enjoy the challenge run a lot more than I enjoy just starting a new playthrough every Monday and making stuff and dropping on a mission. But I am going to do the Comprehensive Guide series. Saturdays and Sundays. So the challenge run Monday through Friday is going to be crazy difficult, pushing myself to the limits, just probably setting myself up for failure or at least a lot of struggles. The comprehensive guide series alternatively is going to be training wheels mode, walking through every single little decision and thought and choice that I make throughout probably several financial reports. Um, I'm probably going to be releasing the Comprehensive Guide series videos for a few months at least. Um, and it's going to be diametrically opposed content. Uh, if you are hardcore into Rogue Tech and you know all the things, you might pick up a bit here or there from the comprehensive guide series, but it's going to be much more targeted at, oh, so you're new to rogue tech and you just got your face kicked in. Let me help you not. <laughs> so uh, yeah, since I've decided I'm gonna put that much into the comprehensive guide series, I kind of don't want to start like dropping on missions and really building mechs and stuff with it until after the save break. Because again, I don't want to get, you know, two weeks into the playthrough or, or, you know, halfway through the first financial report and then have the save break happen and have to start over and do those couple of weeks or whatever again. So what I'm going to do until the save break is just drop the last couple videos just going over the general user interface. I'm not even going to rebuild the mechs. I'm literally just going to drop into a mission just to discuss the user interface in mission and a couple of things. And then I'm going to wait for the save break to actually start showing how to build mechs, how to, you know, how to set up uh, your mech warriors and things like that. Again, with a focus on players that are struggling with the learning curve, players who are new to rogue tech, whether or not they're familiar with the battle tech universe at all, etc. So that's going to be that. That's why I haven't really been releasing the Comprehensive Guide series videos. And I just realized my voice might be getting quiet as I like scratch my nose or whatever. Whoops. Um, but yeah, uh, in addition to that, I'm going to try to release some dev lectures here and there wherever, just kind of in the hopes that maybe some of them get traction and draw of people who are like interested in specifically my takes on some game dev stuff to maybe something something uh, basically i have no expectations for youtube ever actually being beneficial to my game dev career in any like largely meaningful way but i might as well just kind of every once in a while with minimal effort toss some stuff out to see you know if the chum in the waters draws any big you know whales and finally, for the YouTube channel, I am going to be finishing XCOM 2, streaming it on YouTube, 
because I already started and got so far in, some of you have characters in the playthrough, and I would like to have a resolution rather than just the game crashed, I lost over an hour of frustration, and just not going back to it. Um, that's not why I haven't gone back to it. I mostly went back to it because, again, I already wasn't sleeping because I was putting in so many hours on the other stuff. But I'm going to take time to actually do some XCOM 2 streams, probably starting this weekend and pushing through until XCOM 2 is concluded. And that brings me to the final point of the video. The big reveal of my new long con. Long con version 2. I'm going to start streaming on Twitch at some point. That's exactly why, well, that's the main reason why you've been watching me model Nickel in the, uh, in the, the video for this as I speak is because I'm going to do the YouTube thing. Sometimes I'll do face cam. Sometimes I'll have Nickel dancing around doing whatever, being hopefully entertaining and interesting enough for people to click on my stream, even if they're not particularly interested in whatever I'm doing. Um, this is going to be not a, I'm going to hardcore focus on this, that, or the other. It's literally going to be, I need some time to play a game and chill, so I'm going to just pop on a stream and just do whatever. Uh, or I'm working on whatever aspect of my game, so I'm just going to stream some game development, etc., etc. It's It's going to be the one thing I will definitely not be doing on Twitch is Rogue Tech. I, uh, I think I'm definitely going to keep all the rogue tech on the YouTube channel because it's a niche that largely, you know, there, I think there's like four or five channels that cover rogue tech, really. So I don't have, you know, the most competition for those videos, blah, blah, blah. I do something a little different from what, you know, especially Bardool does. So YouTube is going to basically just be rogue tech with occasional little stuff for game development. Twitch is primarily going to be the game development. Um, most of my streaming time is going to be me working on my game. Now, I will likely start off playing a game, relaxing a bit before I get to work or something like that. I might take breaks from work to play a game or two here and there or whatever. Because Twitch lets you actually update in the middle of your stream what you're playing, what you're doing, whatever. So I can have a stream that's, you know, um, art stream. And then it can be like programming stream or whatever. Just talking stream, what, whatever. Uh, or a specific game that I'm playing at the moment. Something like that, you know. Pop in for a couple of runs of Slay the Spire or something. You know, whatever. I can just play things on a whim. Unlike YouTube where I have to record and edit and render and up, I can just click start streaming and then do stuff. But the biggest benefit to Twitch, especially over YouTube, is it's a lot easier to get some traction as a small Twitch streamer. If you have something interesting going on, if you are one of the few channels actively doing whatever or playing whatever. The key thing is there's a system called rating, if you're not familiar with Twitch, where when a channel is ending their stream, if they say have 50 viewers at the end of their stream and they're like, okay, I'm gonna go to sleep, there's actually a system in Twitch where they can raid another channel. So they'll look through the channels to see if maybe somebody's playing what they're playing, to maybe see if, you know, something looks interesting, whatever, and then funnel their viewers at the end of their stream into a, another stream, which may be a small channel that only has one or two or however many viewers. And all it would take is one kind of large Twitch streamer one time raiding my stream 
giving me a chance to introduce my devlog to a couple hundred people. And it would have already done in one instance, one time, more to bring exposure and attention to my game dev project than all of the devlogs I've done so far. So it's a lot more, you know, I have to have something quality going on to potentially get the raid, but if I do, then a, a single lucky night could potentially do more for my game dev um, promotion than all of the work I've done on YouTube so far. So I think that's what I'm gonna try at least for a while and see if that works. Uh, so probably I gave YouTube two years so far of my life. I can give Twitch at least a year, you know? And who knows, maybe it'll burn down because apparently there's always some Twitch drama or something. I don't know. But if I can get any eyes on my game via Twitch before that happens, cool. So, that was the big reveal. I'm going to start Twitch streaming. Um, yeah. So, in the, in the description, there will be a link to my Twitch thing. Um... I'm pretty sure I don't have to have actually streamed at all for people to follow my Twitch handle or whatever. Um, but yeah, so finally, that now that we're at the end of the video, the plan with no definitive dates, really, uh, just kind of as I get to them and do them, we have the roadmap for... Well, I kind of already went over the roadmap for Rogue Tech. <laughs> but as far as the, the game dev lecture series, um, I'm going to be releasing a video on roguelikes, a video on roguelike deck builders. That much I had already made clear. After that, I'm going to do a series of videos on tutorials and tutorialization and onboarding and generally getting players from I have no idea what I'm doing to I am playing the game successfully. I am then going to do a series on monetization, which I think even if you're not a game developer, it's worth knowing about. And uh, especially being able to identify practices that are less than honest, I guess is a good word for it. Just there are, there are some predatory monetization practices and I'm going to be going over some of them. Most notably, if you watched the uh, deck builder video I made, you'll probably have noticed that I have some opinions about loot boxes. It may surprise you to hear that I don't think they're inherently evil. I just feel like it's very easy to have predatory loot box systems. And I will definitely be touching on battle passes. I will definitely be touching on gacha games etc, etc, pay to win games, cosmetics, etc, etc, etc. It's going to be really interesting and really fun. And yeah, I have no idea when I'm going to do it, but it is on the list. <laughs> and those are basically the game dev lecture videos that I intend to make over the next year or two. But again, primarily the YouTube channel is going to be for Rogue Tech and most, mostly, almost exclusively for Rogue Tech. Just because YouTube largely wants me to just put out one type of content that everyone subscribes for so that they will promote it more, so that more people will subscribe, so that the channel will grow. And who knows, maybe in a couple of years, playing by the, the you know, YouTube algorithmic requirements, Maybe I'll be able to get to a point where I'm able to release game dev videos and they actually survive instead of, you know, doing well for a couple days and then tapering off. Now, it is worth noting that those of you who have watched the devlogs, it is very much appreciated. They have not flatlined anymore. It's just the slope is very, very small. So it's only it's only being exposed to a few people every day as compared to thousands, like the first two days. So, um, 
it, it is definitely better than flatlining, but until the channel grows, I don't think I have much of a chance of, for example, uh, the video I released, your first weeks in Rogue Tech, over a year ago, that thing still gets shown to a lot of people every day. Just because it met the threshold requirements. It, uh, yeah, it, it, it satisfied YouTube's algorithm, and so it is still promoted to this day. So I just need to get to the point where all my videos do that. <laughs> No big deal, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely continue doing the YouTube thing, but largely focusing on not overexerting myself. If I have to miss an upload now and then, I will. I'm not going to run myself ragged making sure I upload 365, you know. But I will definitely still release Rogue Tech videos every week and definitely multiple per week, starting after the save break. And my goal is going to be to release a video every day because that is what promotes growth on YouTube the most. So that finally brings me to the roadmap for the game dev stuff. Um, yeah, again, hopefully February-ish, I'll be done with the world map. And at that point, I will be working on the user interface and the input system. And part of that work on the user interface, user interface and input system is going to be beginning the alpha build towards being playable. Um, once I have the user interface system and input system finalized, again, with a focus on being able to accommodate as many players regardless of disability or barriers. I wanna, I wanna be able to get that done but as it's being done, I, I will be working on implementing systems, putting the code together, snipping, or, uh, stitching everything back together in Unity. Uh, and then after I have the UI and the input system functioning as expected, as, as desired, before I worry about polishing it and you know making it look really great, I'm gonna start character modeling. And while I'm character modeling, I will, you know, be able to again stream, work in Blender doing the 3D models, and so I will have something much more interesting to watch than plugging some code together. Um, and that's really where I expect the biggest potential, you know, drive from Twitch, especially, to really start is. Uh, being able to draw in people who see the 3D models I'm working on and get interested in what they're for. And hopefully I will have the, again, Steam page up by 2024 some point. And I can start directing people to wishlist and Steam has its own algorithm and all of its own hoops to jump through. But it's a process and I just have to make sure I remember from here on out that Literally all of my projects, they're all marathons. So if I try to sprint on any of it, I'm just going to end up burning myself out and failing at all of it. So slow and steady, turtle not the hare. And yeah, that's it. That's that's the update for literally everything that I'm doing. Um, yeah, so I look forward to seeing you around and... Uh, <laughs> Definitely check the links in the description. Um, the Brigandine Discord is where I'm going to be doing the alpha testing and getting feedback from the alpha testing. Um, so definitely pop in there. You'll see uh, you'll see in the Discord, there's a section for Curious of Conquest that the mods of the Discord have graciously given me. And uh, that's where you can actually already actively discuss the game project with me. Uh, obviously, comments on YouTube videos, I answer them, I respond to them, I read them, etc., etc. The channel's small enough that I can literally read every content, uh, every every comment, no problem. Doesn't take very long. There's only a few here and there. And yeah, last but not least, um, the Twitch channel. Check out the link in the description. Follow me if you care. Uh, <laughs> I I will probably again start going live after I'm done with the XCOM playthrough on YouTube. And then, yeah, that's that. So, 
I hope you enjoyed the video. And until next time, have a good one.